Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the DeFord Lecture Series. My name is Elizabeth Catlos and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Geological Sciences here at UT Austin. Um, we're part of the Jackson School of Geosciences and the DeFord Lecture Series is our departmental seminar series. It's been a requirement and tradition for all graduate students since the late 1940s and the lecture series is named after Professor Roland DeFord who joined the university as a professor in 1948 with the purpose of enhancing the quality of the graduate program of the department. And our speaker today will be introduced formally by Dr. Mark Hesse, who is an associate professor in the Jackson School of Geosciences. Mark. Hi there, hello everybody. So today's speaker, we're fortunate to have Christine McCarthy from Lamont Dorsey Earth Observatory. Christine got her uh, bachelor's in geophysics in 2003 uh, at the University of Oregon and then uh, went to the University of Brown to do both a master's in geological sciences and a PhD. Uh, and that's that's where we met. She did her PhD with Reed Cooper uh, in ice and rock mechanics. And this is still the topic that she's uh, working on. After finishing a PhD at Brown University, she went to, well, uh, to the University of Tokyo to work with uh, Professor Take, who's also a famous uh, rock mechanicist and they worked on partially molten rocks and their rheology. Um, and ever since she, she turned from Tokyo, she's been uh, at Lamont Dorsey Earth Observatory, first as a postdoctoral fellow, and then as an assistant and now as an associate uh, research professor. So this is very similar to the, um, the people that are at Duke uh, here in school. Uh, leader of the rock and ice mechanics laboratory, uh, works on a, on a broad range of things, mostly on ice, more recently also on things like uh, mineral carbonation uh, of ophiolites and things like that. She's won a number of awards. She won, already had, she won the NASA Planetary Geology Geophysics Research Award. She was a NASA Early Career Fellow and she had uh, support from the Unger Wettlesen uh, Foundation. Um, yeah. With this, I would like to welcome you, Christine, and please get started. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, we've been, Mark and I have been talking about my coming out to Austin for a long time now, and uh, I, you know, I hear great things about Austin. I've been really looking forward to it. Uh, I'm, it's unfortunate that I can't actually be there in person, um, but uh, I'm in all of your living rooms, and you're here in with mine. And um, and I just, I'm still happy to, to, to be able to talk to you and hopefully in the future I'll come out in person. Um, when Mark um, told me uh, to put together a presentation, there's so many exciting things that I wanted to talk about and it was becoming like a three hour talk. And so, you know, things had to go, things had to be cold. So uh, the, the focus I'm gonna be talking about today is, um, is in particular, I've been talking about friction. Um, that's friction experiments have been um, what I've been focusing on since I've been at Lamont. And because even that can be a, a broad range of, um, of possible things to talk about. So I'm going to focus on, um, on in particular temperature effects and how this ranges from the, the, the temperature um, on terrestrial applications to planetary, but also a term called stability, um, which I'll be working on um, describing in a bit. Um, and so before I get started, I wanted to bring up a, a topic called of homologous, homologous temperature. When we talk about ice, um, we have to think about where it is on the spectrum of homologous temperature. How relative is it to its melting temperature? So um, the first part of my talk, when I talk about terrestrial glaciers, we're really hanging out here at like 95% of melting. But when I get to um, ice that's found outer in, the, in the outer solar system, we're really talking about this much broader range. And in terms of homologous temperature, when you work in this space, you can really start to compare the behavior of other polycrystalline materials. So you can do sort of this, this comparison between materials. And I'm a big supporter of, of analog materials um, being able to really tell you about processes that occur. Yes, there are, of course, differences um, and definitely differences in gross material properties. But the behavior really follows uh, according to the relative temperature to its melting temperature. So, um, and so that's what I'll be talking about today. 
And in particular, my sort of uh, niche or like way of uh, looking at the world is I'm thinking from micro to macro. So what are the things at the microscopic level um, in, a, in a real sample in your hands? Um, what are the things that affect the bulk property? So things like defects that are like grain size or second phases, porosity. Um, the second phases could be solid or they could be melt, um, hanging out at little tri triple junctions, um, or the defects could align to create fabrics. I'm also very interested in, in what the time scale of the forcing, um, the frequency of the stress that the material is feeling. And so this is kind of what I return to and, and what I'm thinking about, um, and in particular, when I'm looking at these kinds of big uh, macro scale processes. So turning to ice, first starting with ice in our own backyards or to our poles, to be more exact, um, it's fleeting. We find that um, we're losing it and we're losing it faster than we would like. And we wanna know how fast we're losing it. Um, comes as no surprise to anyone on this call, I'm sure that um, we're very concerned with sea level rise. And um, one of the many, but one of the major contributions to sea level rise is of course, um, the, the movement of ice that is currently on land, moving out to um, and melting out to the ocean and contributing to sea level rise. And um, there's a lot of certainty, uncertainty when we have these projections and um, so this is what I'm going to be talking about in these first few slides is, is just sort of one small puzzle piece, just a small piece, but to this larger question of, um, of how fast the, um, the land ice is melting. Um, and you know, so there are large variations in ice flow. Now I'm kind of focusing on Antarctica. And um, there's large variations, everything from um, essentially it's stagnant ice at the divides. Um, these are the shelves that are, that are floating, moving very quickly. Something I'm more focused on is, is what's happening here in the, in the yellow streams. So these are called ice streams. Um, and it's these, these sort of narrow channels of very fast moving ice, relatively fast. This is meters per year. Um, that is transporting that interior ice in the zones of accumulation out to the sea. And of course, it's very complicated, and there's a lot of things that contribute to the rate of that flow. Um, but but they're very important, and it's it's said that um, that the con complete deceleration or stagnation of just one um, could con contribute significantly to sea level rise to, to decrease. But I guess the inverse of that is probably also true in that one that is currently stagnant, if it was reactivated, that could also um, really lead to an increase in sea level rise. So we wanna understand the, the processes that control the sliding. So some of the things that control um, the flow of these ice streams um, internally, you um, would have viscous deformation. And I'm not gonna be talking about that today. There's definitely been um, just decades of studies before I came to ICE um, studying the, the viscous deformation of polycrystalline ice, particularly related to glaciers. So I'm not going to um, tread on that territory. Like there's been some solid work done on that. Uh, instead, I'm gonna be focusing on um, a part we don't get to see very often. Um, it's really hard to sample and, and really know what's going on down there. And that's what's happening at the base, this basal sliding. And there have been a lot of different um, descriptions of, of what, what is happening. Kind of a classic view is this sort of idea that at the pressure melting point that you would have a, a liquid layer and it would be essentially kind of floating and slip sliding along on this liquid layer um, versus anything above the melting pressure, it would be stuck. And so um, what we're trying to do though, because I, I started working on this when I came to Lamont where it was, a, it was really a, a friction lab, you know, started by Chris Scholes decades ago. It was the, the origination of um, really earthquake and rate state friction theory. And, um, and so we wanted to try to tackle this problem um, more as a, a frictional property. So like thinking about it, like you do with earthquake faults and thinking about asperities and um, this little contact and like what's going on at the micro level 
to control the frictional processes um, at the bottom. And so some of the questions that we are thinking about when it comes to basal sliding um, is that there's some observations that quite a few um, ice streams are kind of sl sliding smoothly. They, they're, they're like creeping faults. You know, there are sections of the San Andreas Fault that just creep slowly. So there's, there's portions, there are many, many glaciers and ice streams that move that way. But there are, are some, in particular one noteworthy one, Willen's Ice Stream, uh, which has earthquakes like events. So this stick slip, it's, it's otherwise um, mostly stuck and then it lurches forward. And so that to us very much seems like a frictional process that we could try to explore in the lab. And so can we use those same formulations that have been used for decades to describe faults, to try to understand ice stream flow? So we embarked on a study of ice friction, but of course we were not the first to study ice friction. Ice friction has been studied for, for decades. Um, the, the friction of ice uh, or something sliding on top of ice, um, whether that's metal or rock or steel has been studied for a long time. Of course, um, mostly with application to um, winter sports or um, say, automotive safety, you know, getting, making sure your tires can get some traction. Um, but we were going to focus on, in particular, um, in this sort of in-between range of velocities that were consistent with um, the, the speeds that ice streams move. And we wanted to really explore this um, as rock mechanics folks. Um, and so we were inspired by a, a study out of the uh, Penn State lab by, by Luke Zoet. Um, using this biaxial apparatus. Um, theirs was a big rock apparatus and we decided to build um, an apparatus that's specific to ice. So it doesn't have to be so beefy and burly. Um, it could uh, have a little bit more space in the middle, uh, which is where we apply the cryostats so we can have a really careful control of temperature during our experiments. And the geometry we have is this what's called double direct shear configuration where we got two um, in our case, these were two rock samples on the outside and an ice sample in the middle. And the rock, side, rock samples are held constant and they're held together, um, kind of squeezed together with the horizontal piston, which is the normal stress. And then with a, a program, we push the, the middle through, the middle sample through and measure um, the shear stress, the resistance to sliding at some known velocity. And we are carefully um, using um, decades of knowledge about how to make really, you know, perfect polycrystalline ice samples that are have reproducible grain size, and, and we're really trying to, to keep all of that microstructural data to try to inform our our response. Um, we have a walk-in freezer where we make our samples, and um, this was an early picture, but. Um, the, the first runs, we keep it all insulated now, <laughs> but our first runs, we took the different door off so we could see this is our very first ice on rock friction experiment, um, you know, five or six years ago. And, um, and so this, I keep talking about rate and state friction. I'm not going to go into real, a lot of detail, but the rate and state friction developed out of this, this observation that um, that friction not is, is not just kind of this Coulomb friction, whether it, you know, exceeds the, the friction coefficient. There's also a little bit more to it. The friction value depends on rate and relative to the rate it was going, and it depends on state, like this, this character of the interface and how that might change during, um, during a, a not hold, a, a hold in the velocity and, and things like that. And so I, I'm not gonna get into, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but there's one concept I really want to kind of drive home. Um, because I'll be talking about it for the rest of the talk, and it's this um, stability term. And so, um, so here's a sample of, you know, kind of a cartoon of what our data might be looking like. So we're measuring friction, which is we get that from basically the what this load cell on the top is telling me divided by the load cells on the side. So the shear stress divided by the normal stress is our friction. And here as a function or moving along, you know, you could plot this as time, or in this case, it's plotted as displacement. And up here is the driving program. Say that we have it going at a slow velocity and then we do an instantaneous jump to a faster velocity. This is what the response, kind of a cartoon version of what the response would look like. It'd be plugging along, ah, sorry. It'd be plugging along at um, a steady state value 
as soon as you change the velocity, there's a direct effect, this jump up in friction, and then it evolves to a new steady state friction for this new velocity. And the, the, the key is what is the new velocity? I'm sorry, what is the new steady state friction? Is it um, as drawn in this case where it's lower? So this is the, this A term is smaller than the B term. A minus B is negative. As this cartoon has, this would be called velocity weakening or would it evolve to a higher value? So it's velocity strengthening. So A minus B being positive is velocity strengthening because this defines whether or not you can have earthquake, earthquakes basically. So velocity strengthening um, means that once you start some slip, it basically, it, it gets stronger and it stops. So you can't really build up enough energy for this uh, earthquake to progress, but velocity weakening, doesn't mean that it always will have earthquakes, but it means that this system is, is prime, it, is, it might have earthquakes. And so this is called unstable versus stable. And a, a note about these stick slips that uh, might be possible if you have a unstable velocity weakening system. Um, for instance, what's happening, here's a stress versus time plot. What happens is, you would have this buildup of stress as the, as the block is just stuck, it's not moving. You'd have a buildup of stress and then a, a drastic drop. Um, and that's when it slips forward. So the, the stress is kind of equivalent to like what the spring is doing, increasing and then decreasing. Um, and so again, I, I mentioned a, a minute, a few minutes ago that um, Willens is one down in Antarctica and the, um, has, been observed to be having some of this stick slip behavior. So there are portions of it are, that are aseismic, they're just creeping along, but there are other portions, a couple of sticky spots they're called, um, where they are otherwise kind of stagnant for part of the day and then twice per day they lurch forward in these um, kind of a stick slip or at least slow slip type events. So that was our motivation for studying Iceland rock friction. And here's kind of a classic um, this is our, our, our scheme, our routine for um, running through uh, an experiment. It's very similar to what would be done in the past on rock-rock friction. So we're kind of following in the footsteps of the rock mechanics community where we, we get to it, we kind of ramp up and we get to a steady state value. And then we, we go through a bunch of velocity steps. We also go through what are called slide hold slides where we're trying to understand that character, that state of the interface. And I'm not gonna get into healing and what this means um, for this talk. It's a whole kind of a whole other story, but it, it gives us information about that, that character of the interface and the microstructural changes that occur during a hold. Um, but what I'm gonna be focusing on is, are these velocity steps. And, and we would look at this as a velocity step, and, uh, not a cartoon, but a real data. And we would analyze this and, um, and to try to pull out some of the stability behavior. And also, we also are just looking at just what are the steady state values as a function of velocity. So here are some of the, um, the results. Um, in particular, we decided to look first at temperature. So we went from, from rather cold temperatures for earth cases, uh, minus 20, where the friction is actually quite high. This is comparable to what you see in rock, really, some rock. Um, and then we see as you get closer to the melting temperature, um, the, a decrease in friction. And it's, it's actually pretty linear in this range. Although um, I'll show you data later, it doesn't keep going. <laughs> it kind of flattens off a little bit when we get to a much colder temperature, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So um, one interesting thing though, as, as, as we get lower, getting closer to the pressure, pressure melting temperature, um, there's a precipitous drop off. And what we think is going on there is that, um, particularly in this experiment that I ran, uh, that as you approach the melting temperature, you develop a melt film and the, this melt film completely covers the interface and it lubricates the interface, um, causing the friction, of course, to plummet. And, and so we've got this information that we got from the friction data, was, which is pretty indic indicative that this was going on. Um, we also looked at the microstructure of the ice after the fact, and um, and we can see sort of this recrystallization 
structures, which look very different from the, the rest of the, the core of the sample. So uh, that was a good indicator. But the kind of the slam dunk is there was a pool of ice, I'm sorry, a pool of water at the bottom of my apparatus. So I know that under these conditions, we were able to, to have melt and we see this plummeting of the friction. But one thing I want to point out is that over these um, several orders of magnitude in velocity range, the all of the data are pretty flat. And indeed, um, when we ran the analysis of the velocity steps um, and to try to determine that A minus B behavior, um, indeed, we were having pretty, pretty velocity neutral, um, slightly velocity strengthening behavior. And so the way that we do these um, analysis, we do some curve fitting. And in particular, I wanted to give a, a plug to Rob Scarbeck in our lab. He, um, he wrote a nice paper with a GUI that's, um, that's public access that you can use to analyze this kind of data to pull out um, all those friction parameters. Um, and in particular, I've plotted here that A minus B behavior. And I show over the temperature range in these warm terrestrial conditions of ice on rock, we're getting velocity strengthening behavior from these experiments, which is not what we were expecting, right? Because I just told you we were motivated by observations in nature of, of stick slip behavior. So, um, we wanted to dig in a little further. So we are also realizing that particularly at Willens, but at a lot of different um, ice streams that they are modulated um, by tides. They're doing this oscillatory um, sliding velocities um, that the tides kind of very simply speaking, the tide sort of pushes back, they slow down, and then when the tide is low, they speed up. So they come, kind of have this oscillatory behavior. But again, Willens is stuck and then lurches forward twice during the tide. And so in order to explore this, we um, tried to mimic this. Oh, this is a big hold up. Um, so we tried to mimic this. We wrote a different velocity driving program where we have these oscillations where basically this is the driving program. Our velocity was driving about zero, I'm sorry, about some medium range and in some cases would go down to zero. So um, about one micron per second or here's 10 microns per second. And we saw some really interesting behavior. Um, don't want to get into all of it here, but basically by going through temperature and frequency and amplitude space, we were able to get all of the behaviors. We were able to get stick slips and slow slips and um, just steady, um, stable tidal modulation, some really exciting results. Um, and then an interesting thing is that Rob took his previous GUI, that which is used usually just to look at these velocity steps when you go from one steady state to another steady state. And instead, he rewrote the program to examine the oscillatory parts of the frictional data. And when you do it this way, you instead get this kind of velocity weakening behavior, which is, this is kind of, we're getting kind of deep in the weeds, but I just wanted to, the, the take home for this is that some of our analysis looking at very controlled sort of uh, steady state to steady state um, properties maybe don't tell the whole system when you've told the whole story when you have a very dynamic system. So when a system is, is really getting this kind of modulating um, perturbation, this kind of um, external forcing, it, it's, it's a different story um, and it should be analyzed in, in, in a different way. Um, and so, so kind of a, what do we learn about frictional experiments um, that by, by trying to mimic late, by being, um, uh, inspired by nature, we're trying to mimic nature and do these um, oscillatory forcings, we're able to really reproduce some of the observations with, uh, we're even able to get things like um, doublets on every cycle, or in some cases, period doubling. So, so we're finding really interesting ways that the, the signal seems to be tuned to the forcing, and we're still trying to make heads or tails and kind of try to make a map of behavior. But that we found that was really exciting. And that also that the rate state parameters that we usually talk about may not be the same for these kind of dynamic systems. Um, and that maybe dynamic conditions can be have this sort of at least at some conditions could be inherently unstable and maybe explain some of these behaviors where you otherwise wouldn't expect them. So two companion papers that will be coming out describing in, in far more detail what I just kind of highlighted in the last few slides. Um, and um, also just to give a plug, uh, we also 
Seth Saltiel in our lab um, was looking at adding a little bit more of a complication by adding a till layer, because uh, we've been criticized, well, ice on rock, there's not that many places where it's just ice on rock. So um, he was trying to add some, some little complications by adding a till layer, and he also was able to get under some specific conditions some velocity leaking behavior, and his paper is coming out soon. Forward looking, what do we want to do with this um, frictional processes on terrestrial glacier work? We want to see if we can now take it to the next step. Like, yes, if we can use rate state friction to describe ice stream flow, can we do some more predictive modeling and really start comparing to maybe observation and just basically scaling up the process? Um, and in particular, we're wondering if we can use this style and periodicity of the observations um, to say something, to infer something about the conditions of the base, perhaps, um, or the, yeah, that's just the system itself. And um, a, another thing that we're looking at um, that Seth is working on is adding acoustic emission data. So loading up transducers around the sample um, and, and then measuring the, these events. What does it look like? Or I guess sound like is what it is, it's acoustic. Um, and with that, maybe classifying and coming up with very like descriptions of different types of sliding, whether that's in the till or at the interface, um, cracking, things like that, and make this sort of catalog to describe the waveforms, for instance, for these different events, which we hope could then be um, compared to seismic sig signals. Um, and, and lead to understanding uh, of, of some of the seismic observations that we have. Um, so that's the terrestrial stuff, but let's get back to our homologous temperature space and let's go thinking about ice way out there in the outer solar system um, where the, rain, the temperature ranges can be uh, much larger. And in particular, even though I say sort of generically icy satellites, um, I have favorites. My two favorites, of course, are Europa and Enceladus, moons of Jupiter and, and Saturn. And, um, you know, they're, they're just amazing because there was, um, for several reasons, but one of which is that um, through other indirect means, there's a pretty compelling argument that both of them have a liquid global ocean underneath their icy outer shells. So that's always, of course, very exciting because where you have liquid ocean, there might be life. So there's got that astrobiological potential, um, but there's just also just a lot of really exciting things going on. Um, what looks like tectonics on the surface. And of course, if there's liquid ocean, that begs the question of, of where did the heat come from? And so some of the stuff I'm gonna be talking to you about, you, about with you today is how can you generate heat in an icy shell on these icy moons in the outer solar system? looking a little bit at the tectonics. Um, so this was Europa. I'm, I'm going to apologize right now. I flip back and forth between Europa and Enceladus. Um, I'll try to be specific when I get from one to the other, but, um, but talking about Europa. So, um, so Europa is one of these places that they think that is, I think the only place else in the solar system other than Earth that has what looks like tectonics. Of course, there's still a lot we don't understand about it, but um, all of those same kinds of features that we have on Earth where we have, um, there, there appear to be faults and the faults have offsets indicative of this kind of strike slip faulting. Um, long has been observed, there's, there's long been noticed that there's kind of these extensional bands that look like, like mid-ocean ridge kind of features. And for a long time, they couldn't find any um, features that look like um, convergent boundaries. Um, but this study was putting together sort of, you know, kind of puzzle piecing sort of back in time, um, some of these features and um, uh, realized that there is a, uh, there's a big piece in this, there's a bunch missing. And so um, they proposed this model that there, there could be a, a subduction-like behavior, they called it subsumption. And, um, Oh, I forgot my my number, but I mean, I, all of this you have to take with a grain of salt, and I'm I'm not going to uh, to to argue too heavily on like what are all the features and the controlling features on Europa because I think we actually at this point only have like 10% of the surface uh, at high resolution imaging, so we're piecing together a lot of stories with a small amount of data, and um, hopefully we get a, a mission going out there soon, and and we can get more data back. Um, but now moving on to another moon, to, to, um, to Enceladus. 
there's some great observations there too. The, the most striking, of course, is these um, this tiger stripe feature, which is at the South Pole. Um, there's these four um, large faults that um, have a height high heat flow and higher heat than the surrounding area. And they have been observed to um, basically be having geysers, um, uh, very tall geysers uh, emitting with uh, liquid water plus other materials um, out, of, out, of the, out of the cracks, the, the faults. Um, and these seem to be timed with the tides. So just some of the many questions that, that looking at some of these great features on IC satellites, just some of the questions in particular ones that we can talk about based on lab work is um, what controls tectonics? What's the rheology of the ice over the depth profile? How thick is the shell? I'm not gonna be talking about that one today, but that of course is a big question that people have. And um, something that I get really excited about is what is generating the heat to provide melt at the surface? And, um, you know, but, but also there's all kinds of really big pictures, big questions, like what are the dynamics of plumbing systems of some of these surface features? And, and you know, we've got this heat generation. Is there, is there an energy source? Is there a pathway? What is the plumbing system and a pathway that could be, for instance, used for nutrients? And um, because, you know, does life exist there and does it have the same origin? Now, I'm not going to be talking about that, but that's kind of that thing that like, that feeds you, that like keeps you moving towards this project and questions that ultimately would like to be answered. So kind of a pictorial version of what I just said, um, you know, how can we describe with depth the strength and the, the, the rheology of, of these icy shells? And, um, and if we've got features at the surface, what can, what can we know? And, and can we think about kind of this architecture, fault architecture with depth? And are these the sources of geysers, for instance? Um, something that I've studied a, a lot during my career is tidal dissipation. I won't get into that today, but um, that would be a, a source of, of heat generation with depth. So I think I've alluded to it in my, my homologous temperature line, but the temperature range is pretty, pretty vast on the icy shell. And this time I'm talking about Europa. Um, and there's, but there's still a lot that we don't know. Um, there's that we know based on, I believe, like moment inertia data and things that um, there's 100 or 200 kilometer H2O layer at the outer shell, at the outer portion. And, but we don't know how much of that is solid ice or how much of it is liquid because the densities are, are too close, I believe. Um, so, I mean, there's huge ranges of differences between how much of that could be ice. Uh, what we also don't know is is uh, what would the structure be? Will we, people think there's probably kind of a, a cold stagnant lid, um, but do you have convection happening, which would make your sort of temperature profile um, kind of do something like this? Do you have convection happening in this warmer part of the shell? Um, so we don't know. The, the things we do know is that the average surface temperature is a prop, approximately 100K, it's, you know, it's based on poles and things, uh, locations, but the average would be 100K. And then just by definition, since it, it's in contact with the liquid ocean, it has to go to the melting temperature. So that could be around 273, 270, um, something like that, depending on how many, um, how, what the composition is, how many salts there are. And um, the pressure range, this is, this is a kind of a small moon. Um, so the pressures aren't very high. So in all cases, um, what I'm talking about today, both for Enceladus and for Europa, um, we're just talking about straight hexagonal ice. You don't have to get your, your big phase diagram of ice and think about the, the high pressure polymorphs. For some of the other moons you would, but for this one, we're just talking about regular hexagonal ice. And so how can we describe um, sort of the, the rheology with depth? Um, the, the classic way is to do these sort of lithospheric strength envelopes where you um, describe the brittle behavior and the ductile behavior. And how do we get these kinds? Um, you're probably familiar with this sort of Christmas tree diagram for describing rock on earth. Um, um, but basically they come from experiments. So um, the bottom part is, is defined by, uh, by creep experiments, by measurements of viscosity. Like I said before, viscosity of ice has been measured for decades. Um, 
more than a half century, actually. Um, but, but a lot of it, the majority of it was happening um, with the focus of terrestrial glaciers. So at relatively warm temperatures, um, there are really um, kind of two big papers that came out in the same year that were really thinking about it for a planetary context, going to really small, going to low temperatures and um, exploring the role of grain size. And so these kinds of studies can define the, the ductile part. But focusing on the, the upper part, the brittle part of the strength profile, you would use friction experiments. So the, the, the same kind that I've described to you for our, our ice on rock experiments, you can think about for ice on ice. Um, some of the previous studies, earlier studies, um, use cylinders cut on the like a 45 degree angle and um, apply the stress and a confining pressure and did the same kind of measurement, basically <clears throat> the resistance to sliding. And here, so a lot of folks, this was one of the first papers, this Beeman et al. So a lot of folks who have been um, applying frictional data to icy satellites um, look to that, that study. But um, I don't know if you noticed the, the kind of stresses we were talking about, for instance, for, for Europa or Enceladus, but um, they're, they're significantly lower than that for the stress, the, for instance, the normal stress on the fault. So it, it also might be a good idea um, to think about some of these other studies that have been done more recently. Um, and I, so I show them together, plotted kind of in this log log space, but focusing in on the, the, the lower stressed um, experiments done, these were done um, by Schulson and Forte at um, Dartmouth. And zo zooming in on some of that data, and now on a linear, linear plot, um, the slope of the line would be friction. And in particular, how these are different from the previous study is that they go through the zero point essentially, which means there's no cohesion, which is important for, for modeling um, behavior in the, on frictional faults. And one thing that's not very clear, you can kind of start to see a change in the slope with temperature, but is the temperature dependence of friction when, when it's really cold like this. And so I was exploring that, trying to get a better, better sense of that. And, um, and so for, I'm finding a, a distinct difference based on the velocity of sliding at these really cold temperatures. So, at the really slow temperatures, 10 to the minus six, for instance, kind of a creeping, slow moving fault, um, even up to warm temperatures, uh, the friction is, is mildly temperature dependent, but it's pretty flat. But as you get to higher velocities, 10 to the minus three, you see a real drop off in friction, um, very similar to what I saw in my ice on rock system, um, where you must be creating a melt film at this, this high velocity, which just basically, um, has the velocity, the friction plummet. So that's the temperature dependence of friction kind of over the whole span of, of planetary conditions. Um, but let's return to this idea of stability. Remember again, we're trying to look at this A minus B, B behavior because it tells us whether we could have um, uh, earthquakes or not have earthquakes or stick slip events. Um, so on Earth, returning to Earth here <laughs> in rock, um, you know, the pioneering work uh, before by Chris Scholes um, at Lamont and, and with Marone, they were looking at the behavior of rock um, at conditions consistent with depth. So controlling pressure and, and, and temperature with depth um, in crustal rocks. And they also compared, oh, so they, they looked at the, the behavior and they found this interesting behavior that um, at very shallow conditions and at very deep conditions, kind of transitioning into ductile behavior, um, that they saw stable sliding. This was positive A minus B behavior. But this, this portion kind of in the middle of the crust, um, they were seeing this velocity weakening behavior and they, they looked at the catalog of earthquake of earthquakes and where they initiate the sources, they found that this cores, corresponds with the same sort of A minus B behavior. So this, they call this the seismogenic zone. This would be the, the place where earthquakes start. Um, can we do something like that with ice? Um, we actually can, and it's it's a little qualitative at the moment, but looking at some, some work out of Schulson's lab um, where, I'm sorry, the temperatures are backwards. Um, so <laughs> I 
I, I put I put the one on the the left like the shell, and this is sort of reverse. But you could see in in both cases that at the the warmest and the coldest temperatures, they get this nice, smooth, steady state response. And then at the coldest temperatures, they get these big stick slip events, boom, 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 bunch of stress drops. And um, I've recreated some of these experiments at slightly different temperatures, but in the same range in our lab, and we're seeing very similar results. And, um, and so right now I see there's no numbers here. This is very qualitative, um, but we're, we're, we're able to make this qualitative map that indeed does uh, have the same sort of feature where the really coldest temperatures and deep down there it might just be cruising really slowly a creeping fault but then here in the middle might be a place on icy satellites where you have places stuck and then jolts forward at a fast velocity um, during an event um, why why do I care about that um, I think that's kind of exciting for for two main reasons one is that um, I know there are people who are planning missions in the future and they want to, for instance, put instance put seismometers on the feet of landers and try to use um, seismic data to, to image the shell, give us some clue as to the, the depth, for instance, of the shell. And, um, and granite, I think seismolo seismologists are, can do some amazing things with, for instance, just ambient noise and normal modes and things like that. But I bet they'd be a lot happier if they actually got some events that they can work with. So, um, so th this sort of still qualitative preliminary work shows us that um, by temperature stability alone, um, there should be able to get um, events on icy satellites. And the second thing, I, the reason this excites me is that um, thinking about another property, which is frictional heating. So I, I told you, I think I, in the beginning that I wanted to talk about where melt could come from. And there are various sources of heating um, on icy satellites. Um, impacts is, that's something I haven't studied, but it's important. Um, tidal dissipation I have studied, <clears throat> but I don't want to get in it today. But we're, we're, today I want to think about sort of in this mid range, frictional heating. So this is a very simple, simple description or equation for frictional heating, but basically it depends on your friction, your friction coefficient, the, um, the, the pressure on that fault, that basically rho GH, you know, like the, the normal stress, which increases with depth on that fault and U, which is the velocity. Um, and, you know, this looks just like a steady state value, but I just, Sorry, but I just told you that um, that friction depends on temperature and it depends on velocity and the velocity might depend on whether it's stable and whether it's having events or creeping. And so there's a lot of, I think, exciting um, feedbacks and possibilities that that hopefully um, could tell us a little bit about um, now I've moved over to Enceladus. <laughs> it would tell us a little bit about frictional heating on these icy bodies and if it's enough to generate melt and to generate um, heating. So uh, for these experiments, um, which are being initiated by um, first year grad student Mahi in our lab, um, we're using that same apparatus that I described earlier for the the rock, ice rock friction experiments, but we got to get cold now. So we um, we have a new system, a new cryostat that uses liquid nitrogen to cool and to get down to these really cold temperatures. So that work is ongoing, and ideally we apply those um, that GUI that Rob made us and try to um, understand the 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 A minus B, the real frictional rate state properties, um, so that we can uh, start putting some numbers on and make it more of a quantitative analysis. Um, and one final thing I wanted to bring up about that is that um, we're not just gonna be looking at pure ice. So um, during one of these eruptions, Cassini at Enceladus, Cassini fortuitously uh, flew right through it and was able to sample the composition that's erupting. And amongst a lot of other things that are really interesting, I, I kind of zoned in on this, this NH3. So this is ammonia, which with ice has a very deep eutectic, really deep, um, which means it's kind of like an antifreeze and, and it, 
it should be a pressure, uh, there should be a big portion of the, the icy shell. I mean, not all the way down to the surface, it doesn't go down to 100, but there's a big range that means in an icy shell that you could have a, a melt, a partial melt phase, even at really small compositions, you could have a partial melt phase. And where that melt might reside, if it's an equilibrium melt structure, is, is kind of, this is my little cartoon of, of ice with melt hanging out in these little triple junctions in the equilibrium melt phase. And um, what's kind of inspired these, these experiments were some really exciting um, kind of first results that I, I got a couple of years ago, where I just at one set of conditions, I took a pure ice sample, ran it through its paces of, of oscillations and and velocity steps and everything. And then I also looked at a, a sample with ice and a partial melt. Um, and this is definitely a part of the phase diagram where the melt was present. And I saw a distinction. So one thing that's important that I th saw is that with this small amount of melt, we did see a decrease in the friction, but not a plummet. Like it didn't drop to zero. So, so having a melt film versus a little individual melt packets um, has a big difference in the response, which I find kind of interesting. I don't know <laughs> the application, but it's sort of a, in a material science uh, standpoint, I find that quite interesting. But, but probably more interesting is that I also saw in at the same, otherwise exactly the same conditions, I saw the stick slip behavior in the sample containing the, the partial melt. And I don't know exactly what to make of that, but an implication of that is that it would have an even broader region of uh, a seismogenic zone that you might have on a, a moon containing a partial melt phase or one of these impurity phases. Um, so that was kind of a whirlwind exploration of, of friction in both on Earth and in the icy satellites. Um, specific to the, the latter, some of the things that we learned in the lab is that um, you know a lot has been done over temperature space um, in, I, in pure polycrystal and ice. And so we can apply what we already know to make these strength envelopes, but there's still a lot left to be learned, understanding the effect of second phases and melt phases um, on these properties. That's something we like to focus on in our lab. And um, I, I'd say something new here is that um, just like we have on Earth where there's a seismogenic zone, uh, we may have that present on icy satellites. And so we're gonna try to <clears throat> better identify that and then frictional heating, it, it, it closely, like I said, depends on friction and on velocity. And, um, and these two in turn might depend on temperature and stability. So we could have some very interesting conditions that cr could create sort of periodic um, and localized melt with depth. And um, in particular, when you have impurities present. So um, I think those are kind of exciting problems that we're tackling in our lab. Our lab is is really big and even growing, and um, it's a yeah we have a lot of people working on a lot of different projects, and it's pretty exciting. We're a pretty good cohesive group. In fact, yesterday, um, those of us that are working on campus even had a little Hanami uh, cherry blossom party, <laughs> socially distance party. We all sat our put our blankets very far apart from each other, but um, we have a good group, and. Um, and so some of the things that we're looking to understand, like I said before, was understand the effects of second phases, um, including solids and, and melt and third phases and understanding cryovolcanism. I talked about what you might be able to create melt, but what happens, what is the fate of that melt once you've created it? Um, we do some testing of technology for missions at our lab because um, we're able to create these icy moon conditions. So we wanna continue to do that. And, um, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to go to even lower temperatures, back to our homologous temperature space. You know, I stopped at Europa is around here, which is good because we can get there with liquid nitrogen. But, um, but down on uh, Pluto and Sharon, uh, you get even lower. You've got nitrogen as a nice solid nitrogen kind of rub rubbing up against um, ice at very frigid temperatures. So, um, this would not be trivial to go down to these temperatures, but that's something that I'd like to do in the future. Um, you know, Europa and Enceladus are my babies, but uh, I, I think that I could, I could learn to love the sky too. It's pretty beautiful. So anyway, <laughs> I digress. Just thank you very much for, for having me. Um,
working in the lab is wonderful. We get to really work with our hands. We get cold, we get dirty. It's fun for the whole family. Um, and, uh, and we have a great time. And I just thank you so much for letting me share some of the fun stuff that we're doing. The, you know, the attenders are dropping off rapidly. Um, and so thank you very much, Christine. Uh, can I have you in person at, at some point? I hope so. That would be wonderful. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to end the presentation now. Thanks. Thank you very much.